Yeah, or before. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming uh, this afternoon here to CSIS. I'm Michael Matera. I'm the director of the Americas program. Uh, I've been here for about six months. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time or watching by webcast um, around the country or around the world, um, CSIS is one of the, the most active and prominent nonpartisan think tanks uh, here in the United States. We've been, ver we've been working very actively over these last six months uh, in standing up our new Americas program um, that has uh, a special focus on Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, uh, and Venezuela. Um, these are the initial focuses during the first, uh, the first months. Um, Dr. Elsir Santana, to my left, uh, who will be moderating the panel today, uh, is the director of our Brazil initiative. Um, we're quite excited to have gathered here today um, a panel that, that we have uh, to talk about some of the technological advances over the past decade in Brazilian agriculture. And more importantly, we want to look at the issue of replicability of some of Brazil's science-based agricultural technology and know-how in other parts of the Americas and Africa. This is a complicated time politically and economically in Brazil, as it is a complicated time here in the United States. Um, when much of the news uh, is about political instability and a continuing economic recession, um, Brazilian agriculture is a story that, that generates lots of good news. Here at CSIS in recent months, we've done a couple of programs um, featuring elements of, of Brazilian agriculture. Um, this development, the, the, the Brazilian agricultural miracle, has been described by many agricultural experts as one of the, the most significant contributions in recent decades to increase production and efficiency and to global food security. Perhaps more than any other factor, it has contributed to significant decreases in both urban and rural poverty in Brazil. Just one impressive statistic, as a result of increased production and efficiency and lower food costs, the average family in Brazil today needs less than 20% of their household budget uh, to buy food as compared to 40% uh, two decades ago. So these are some of the issues that we expect to hear about this afternoon from our panel of experts that come from academia, uh, from industry, from government, and from the international uh, financial institutions, uh, from the IDB. I'm going to turn the panel over to, to Elsir, to Dr. Santana. Uh, Elsir and I traveled together to Brazil a couple of months ago, uh, where we met with a wide range of government officials and, and uh, business leaders, including many involved in the, in the agricultural and agribusiness sectors. We're very pleased to be collaborating today with Apex Brazil, the trade and investment promotion agency of Brazil. And we have Priscilla uh, from Apex with us today. Um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Elsir. Thank you very much. Michael, and uh, if you don't mind, uh, I would prefer this to be taken. Yeah, great. You have to. Okay. Now uh, uh, I'm very pleased uh, to start um, to be moderating this session. Uh, as part of the Brazilian initiative uh, activities. Uh, we, Michael, has been working very hard to put together the new Americas program. And I have been working hard, but not as hard as he has, in putting together the Brazilian program. And we, uh, I'm very pleased to have a panel of this level with this profile. I think we have a, a, a first-class panel today, and uh, I'm very glad that we start talking about agriculture with such a panel. Uh, one thing that strikes me is that uh, we economists, or at least some economists, have a tendency to think of agriculture as uh, a low productivity uh, not efficient uh, sector, and therefore the idea of moving people from to the cities and to the industry is always seen as as a, a, a step towards progress and growth. And agriculture is always seen as something slow and that uh, sort of holds back uh, development and so on. 
I think the, 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 that has been discussed recently, but I think the Brazilian case is an exceptionally clear case. I mean, if you, if you look at the last 30 years, agriculture in Brazil is exactly the sector where productivity has been growing steadily. And, uh, and uh, with, with consequences of, on all levels, I mean, Michael mentioned the, uh, the fact that uh, the social impact of having food costing less, but we could make a list of issues that are related to this. I mean, the Brazilian agriculture, that, that increase in productivity is what has allowed Brazil to become one of the top exporters of uh, uh, meat and different crops, and nevertheless, differently from what we hear sometimes, that has not happened uh, at the expenses of the forest, of the Amazon forest or anything like that. Because the, 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 the science applied to agriculture, I would say agribusiness, has been such that uh, we have been able to increase uh, production with the same or even less resources than before. So it's an issue that has many transversal issues. I mean, we can talk about environment. The Brazilian agriculture does uh, uh, allow us to look into the food security side, the environment side, the energy issue, the water issue that's becoming more and more important, and so on and so forth. So I think it's a case that allowed us to uh, touch on different issues, and we have a panel here that's exactly that. I mean, they, have, they are diverse, and, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing them. Let me start by introducing uh, let me start introducing uh, our friend Priscilla. Priscilla uh, is a, a monitoring and policy advocacy supervisor at Apex in Brazil. She has a, a bachelor in uh, a double bachelor in international affairs and political science at Catholic University in São Paulo and Sciences Po in Paris, and has a master in international public management in Sciences Po. Uh, she, has, she has a vast experience in, in, in several areas in the public administration. She has worked in different organizations, and such as UNESCO, if I'm not mistaken. And more recently, she's in Apex Brazil, where uh, she is working in, the, in, in, in in the intelligence side of the promotion of Brazil. So, uh, Priscilla, please. Thank you, Elsir, for the presentation. And well, first of all, I'd like to thank CSIS for hosting this event uh, on a Brazil agribusiness model and the impact for global development for Apex. And uh, it's, it's quite important to have the agriculture subject to be talked in places uh, such as CSIS for people to have a common knowledge of what, what it is today, Brazilian agriculture. I also like to thank the panelists that are here. I know that uh, some of them came directly from Brazil just to be here today, then it's uh, uh, Paula and all the other panelists that are here. And uh, first of all, I'd like to just start, because I don't know if many of you know Apex Brazil, then I would like to start just
But before starting to talk about um, Brazilian agribusiness model, and my idea here is to make a really brief and basic uh, presentation for us to be at the same page and what are we talking uh, when we say the Brazilian agribusiness model. I would like to just take some key trends and, uh, and to talk a little about population growth. Uh, these are numbers from FAO, and I'm sure that most of you know these numbers, but it's important to state that uh, population in the world is expected to grow by one-third, meaning that between 2009 and 2050, uh, we have an expectation to have more 2.3 billion people in the world. This would result in 2050 in 9 billion people, and the big consequences of that would be the need of raising overall production by 70% more or less. These are numbers of FAO that is important for us when we start a debate on agriculture for us to state. All this uh, come to a really famous co concept and word that we hear all the time and most of you I'm sure are really used to that is the problem of food security. Uh, I want to bring also in the same theme an example, and it comes also from FAO, about meat consumption. What we can see is that uh, we will have from 2000 and 2013, I mean here today, more 20 years, a brace on meat consumption in the world. This, this data is quite interesting because what it says is in developed countries, the expectations of growing meat consumption is 13.5%. But in developing countries, these expectations is the meat consumption to grow by 50, more or less 43.9%, which is a huge number, a quite important one. And when we state that, the, the question that we make is why Brazil will be an exporter of food security? Why we can talk, when we, we talk about food security and when we talk about the needs of the, the future population, why? Can we talk about Brazil? And what I wanted to bring you in a really brief matter, and I think we will be able to discuss this later, is four main points of Brazilian agribusiness model, which is agriculture productivity, reliable water supply, good environmental conditions, and land availability. That's uh, what Elsior has mentioned, and I would just wanted to bring you some numbers for us to be at the same page. When we talk about agriculture productivity, uh, and before talking about that, just to show you where Brazil is in the agribusiness uh, sector in the world. Today, Brazil is the fourth main agriculture pro pro producer in the world, just after China and the United States. And these numbers are from 2013. Uh, in this year, for example, we produced $154 billion in agriculture. Um, also, what we can say in terms of products, Brazil is the main uh, producer in sugar, coffee, orange juice, in all those free uh, products. We are the main exporter also. And we can say that, for example, in soybeans and chicken meat, we are also the main exporters of these products. Uh, other important products for us are uh, in our, in the Brazilian production, is beef, maize, soybean meal. Uh, soybean oil, pork, and cotton, and Brazil has uh, uh, an importance in, in all those uh, productions. For example, just to, to take a number, which I think is quite an interesting one, in chicken meat, uh, we sell chicken meat for the world. We are the main exporter for more than 135 destinations. Then Brazil has a, a really important role in terms of agriculture and exports in agriculture. Uh, and if you take the some other numbers, just to put it in, other play, uh, in the same page where Brazil is in terms of agriculture exports. Today, Brazil represents 1.4% of the world trade, which is not huge. But if we see the number in terms of world agriculture trade, uh, Brazil represents 6.9% of the market share, which is quite important. Uh, if we see in terms of um, value numbers, uh, Brazil agriculture exports uh, were in 2015 around uh, 74 billion dollars. And if we compare of what uh, with what the world asked uh, in like the, the imports of the world agriculture agriculture imports, it was 1.1 trillion dollars. And we have a really representative role. 
And finally, if we want to talk about then productivity, thinking about uh, what is Brazil role? I think the first thought that we have when we see Brazilian numbers is, of course, Brazil is a huge country. Probably we use a lot of land for this production. But what we can see if we analyze the numbers, and I think that's quite important to state because it's, uh, we have a lot of uh, people that don't know these numbers. If, if we saw the, we compare the area in Brazil and the productivity of our agribusiness, agri we can see that we have in 38 years uh, raised productivity by 220%, meaning that during the 70s, as we can see in the graph, uh, our productivity was between 1.4 tons of grains, specifically, by hectare. And today we have a productivity of 4.5 tons of grains uh, by hectare. And that, these numbers are quite impressive and quite interesting. And, and something that we could say is that if we had the same productivity of the 70s, let's say like this, today, we would have 150 million hectares of land that would have been required to the same production. And it, it didn't happen because we raised significantly productivity in Brazil. And I think these are numbers that not necessarily are known but I think it's important for us to state. When we talk about livestock, we see the same logical also. We, we have this interesting graphic uh, which shows the difference uh, in terms of pasture area, that we see that we have uh, less pasture area being used in Brazil and the productivity by hectare also rising. Then we see that not only on the grain sector, but also in livestock, we state that productivity in Brazil has been, this graph is from the 90s till today, then the last 20 years, uh, we or 30, actually, uh, productivity has been raising in Brazil significantly. Then it's really important for us to state and to show this to you. When we talk about land availability, and uh, we were talking about, we are producing more and more in Brazil in less, in less uh, land, but also what we can say is that we have land availability in Brazil to extend production. One region uh, which is really well known for, uh, for those who deal, uh, uh, that are already inserted in the agribusiness sector is the, what we call MAPITOBA. MAPITOBA is an acronym for uh, four states in Brazil. It's a, it's a region you can see in the map uh, where it's located. States there are Maranhão, Bahia, Tocantins and Piauí. What we what we say is that this region is considered one of the last agriculture frontiers in expansion in the world. Then it's, it's quite an important frontier uh, today uh, in Brazil. It's not totally uh, used, but you, it already represents 10% of the national production in Brazil. There in Mapitoba, you already have soybeans, corn, rice, cotton, but also you have a prominent uh, production of fruits that is being uh, worked in this region. And the expectations, at least, is the working agriculture in, in the agribusiness in the region will make and turn Brazil into the first largest agribusiness exporter. And this, because it represents a, an area of more or less 90 million hectares to be able to, to use, then what we can state uh, with the two, uh, let's say, the two main subjects is that we're using better the land, but we still have land to, to use, and that's it's quite important when we talk about food security. Uh, the third theme when we talk about reliable water supply, and I will just show you a graph that state Brazil, uh, if we compare availability of land for agriculture use and renewable water resources, uh, Brazil is really well positioned compared to other countries that are strong in agriculture, such as Australia and Russia and our, uh, our neighbor Argentina. And this is, is quite important to state because one of the questions today, well, a huge geopolitical question on the wider crisis and how, how, how it will affect food security, what we can say is that our model and the agribusiness model of Brazil have answers for that too. And I think it is important um, to know the numbers and know the comparisons. 
Well, and finally, because it will be really a brief presentation, quite a positive one, I, <laughs> I would, I would, I'll talk about environmental condition and actually just two points. One is that today uh, we have a new forest code and I know that for the Brazilianists that are here and probably listen to us and the internet, you know, uh, because the forest code was really openly debated in the Brazilian society. We had, uh, it was all the time on the paper. We had NGOs, uh, government, uh, private companies discussing the private code. It was quite a big subject in Brazil. And the result was a code that gives a lot more protection in terms of environment. Uh, it promotes the restoration of natural vegetation, uh, contain illegal and regular deforestation. And here you can see some numbers, actually the forest code, the new forest code, it's work on, on Brazilian biomas. And uh, the idea is to establish uh, percentage of the, what has to be protected in the bioma. Then we can see, for example, in terms of the Amazon forest, 80% of the Amazon forest must be uh, restored in natural vegetation and also other uh, important biomas of us such as the Cerrado, and I'm sure that uh, we're going to speak about it. 35% uh, of the Cerrado must be restored. And then this, this legal instrument is quite important also to know that our agribusiness model is not only uh, working in expansion productive, but it's also regulated by a restrict and important forest code. And just to finish, actually, I will talk, so, show some numbers about the reduction in gross deforestation. I think this is a subject that is, that is shown by the Brazilian government in different areas, such as in the global debates on environment, COP21, COP22. These are well-known numbers, but I think it's important for us to remember. In terms of gross deforestation, we had a reduction in the last years, uh, an important one, and uh, this was also uh, led by uh, better regulations in terms of deforestation. And what we can see is that uh, from 2014, for example, until 2015, we had a, a, an important reduction in terms of deforestation that will uh, arrive for more or less 70.3% in terms of reduction. Then I think the conclusion in, in all this the subjects that I have raised, that the Brazilian, and I'm being really positive here, uh, <laughs> I hope uh, for you to know that Brazilian agribusiness model actually uh, is not so well known in all those four subjects. And it's important for us to, to show this, that we have been working on productivity and to use better the land, but to also protect it better too, and, uh, and for the Brazilian agribusiness production to be uh, more efficient and more productive. Thank you so much. Thank you. thank you, Priscilla, and thank you also for staying within the 15 minutes. So, yes. thank you. And um, I would like now to uh, give the floor to Paula, Paula Pereira de Oliveira. She's Project Coordinator on Sustainable Finance at Fundação Getúlio Vargas, which is one of, I wouldn't say the best, just because some friends will be complaining about that, but one of the best institutions in Brazil. And Paula uh, works on, on that sustainable finance at Fundação Getúlio Vargas in the Center for Sustainability. She, uh, she has a, an interesting experience. She started as an engineer and then she moved to the financial market. And then she did a master in, in sustainability and got totally hooked by the issue and committed, and then she, that's what she's doing now. After an impressive experience in the financial market and, uh, and, uh, and some other uh, jobs. Paula was a, a, a researcher at Febraban, which is uh, the Federation of Banks in Brazil, and uh, and uh, did quite a few researches about it. And uh, and uh, and she has been working on mechanisms to finance low carbon uh, agriculture. She has a bachelor uh, in management science and engineering, 
at Stanford, and an MBA in Sustainable Management at Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Please, Paula. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, again, I'd just like to thank, uh, first of all, CSIS and also Apex for the invitation. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the evolution of Brazil's sustainable agricultural techniques and how that's helping to boost productivity and also the potential for um, Brazilian agriculture. So the idea here is, is to present a couple of the research we've been doing at Fundação Getúlio Vargas in the subject matter. Um, and then hear from, from our colleagues and open to some discussion. Um, so um, Priscilla already gave a, a wonderful introduction on the importance of the Brazilian agro industry and its importance to our GDP and to our exports and why agriculture is so important um, for Brazil. So I'm not going to um, get into that. I'm just going to go straight into the research. But it's important to say that um, not only has productivity gains have been occurring in, in Brazil, as, as Priscilla has shown, but there's a huge potential for more increase in productivity aligned with low carbon techniques. Um, actually, if we look at the what OECD and FAO said in their agricultural analysis is that the yield improvements will be responsible for 80% of the increase in output in agriculture in the next 10 years. And so, Thinking about that and thinking about the potential that Brazil has to increase productivity, we can only uh, imagine that there's a great opportunity here. Um, if you look at this, Priscilla showed already a, a graph that, that shows the amount of the increase in production for meat and the decrease in the need of land. So this is just another graph that um, shows the, the potential. So we see that this has been happening already from 2005 to 2015, but it's really interesting to see the potential from 2015 to 2025 that we will see a decrease, the numbers are hard to see, but you're gonna see a, a decrease from 178 million hectares to 161 million hectares, but an increase in production from 10 million tons to 13.7 million tons. And when we look at that, we see that there's a huge potential to join the economic agenda with the environmental agenda. Because what that means is that more productivity will decrease pressure in land, which is very much in line with the environmental agenda that I'm gonna bring up so much here. Um, but then the question is, if we have that opportunity and we have those project projections, how is that going to happen? And how has that actually been happening already in Brazil? Um, and this is where I go into the ABC plan. Um, I don't know how many of you um, have heard already about the ABC plan, but Brazil has an innovative public policy already in place uh, since 2010, actually, um, which is called the Low Carbon Agricultural Plan. And the idea of the Low Carbon Agricultural Plan is that there will be investments in low carbon techniques for agriculture with a, a program, a financial program that has subsidized um, interest rates and that will go through all of the financial systems for the production sector and with that it will help not only increase productivity but also reduce GHG emissions and therefore be in line with the environmental agenda of reducing GHG emissions but also help the agriculture to be more resilient to the vulnerabilities of climate change. Um, so we have an expert here from Embrapa and he can tell you more of the technical details of, of it. But just to explain very quickly is that the idea is that if you improve rundown pastures and if you make investments on rundown pastures, not only will you have more resilient soil, but you will also have carbon capture from that soil. And with that also a more productive land where you can put more uh, animals in, in that area per hectare. And so this is one of the techniques that the ABC plan and program um, provide. But there are also other techniques such as integration of crop and livestock and forests and um, other fixation techniques that after we could, we could have a long discussion about it. Um, but the importance of these techniques is that they have the potential to up the productivity and also help um, the producers be in compliance with the new forest code, so it'll help in terms of compliance, and also help in the international um, commitments that Brazil has already done 
um, in COP21 and ratified it and as we're discussing it afterwards in, in COP22. So what, what does this plan actually say? So there's different funding lines. There, it should mobilize 157 billion highs until 2020, finance with rural credit. Um, there are, from all of these different funding lines, there are different goals of restoration. So for example, for the restoration of rundown pastures, it's 15 million hectares. And then on the international commitment that Brazil did, there's an extra 15 million hectares of um, recovery of burned down pastures. In terms of integrated um, integration of crops and livestock, we have, for example, 4 million hectares um, in the goal of the ABC plan, and then on the Brazilian NDC, an extra 5 million hectares. This is just an idea for you to know um, how the federal government has all of these goals in place. It has already um, a finance line that is in place and that is um, working, and I'm going to show a little bit of the results right now. Um, but we also have a lot more that needs to happen. So um, I'm going to show a little bit about of the results up until now, but we definitely have a long, a long way to go. But it's definitely all already in goals and planned for the next upcoming years. Um, and it's just important to put also in terms of the forest and reforestation, Brazil has a goal of reforesting 12 million hectares that is on the Brazilian NDC, um, as well as on um, the ABC plan. And there is a financial line also available for that. And um, I'm going to go a little bit into more details of what the potential of that is. So um, the question now becomes, when we have a public policy in place, we have a financial mechanism in place, is it working? Is, and, and what's the potential um, to get it to work even better? So us at FGV, we created this observatory, which is a joint effort of um, GV Agro, which is another center inside FGV, um, which is headed by the former agriculture minister, Mr. Roberto Rodriguez, um, the Center for Sustainability Studies, and also in Brapa. And we have, since the beginning of the ABC plan, monitored what has been happening in terms of this public policy. And so what we can see, one of the, the, the main results that we can see is that over 70% of the financial resources up until now have been going to restoration of um, rundown pastures, which is good, it's, it's not bad news, it's good news that it's, all, it's going a lot to restoration of rundown pastures. What we think there is a huge opportunity in the future to also um, put more money into integration of livestock and cattle and forests, of livestock um, crops and forests, and also for the environmental side to get more money into restoration finance, which is something that is quite new and untapped still in Brazil and has a huge necessity. Um, in terms of financial uh, values, as I mentioned in, in the beginning, there is 157 uh, billion reais for rural credits that is available until 2020. And up until now, we've only used 23.4 billion, um, which seems like is, it's bad news because it's still not used a lot. But the good news is, is that, A, well, first you have uh, uh, a learning curve. Um, what we're talking about here first in the first couple of years, uh, People still don't have the information about this line. They don't know how to access this line. Financial institutions need to be taught also how to um, make this line available. Uh, there has been a lot of work from the government and from Embrapa to do a lot of capacity building on, on all sides, basically, in order to get people to know. And that's also one of the big um, um, work that Apex is doing now is to um, promote the understanding of, of the potential that this line has. Um, and also, there has been a huge work from the financial institution uh, sector in order to make the system quicker, in order to approve credit. And so even though you might look at the graph right now and see that this last crop season we had um, a tip down, um, it has mostly to do with the economic time and not a lot with uh, the, the need for the administrative process of the financial institutions. If you look closely, and in all of our reports, we have them in English in our website, I'm not going to go super into detail 
into it right now, but actually BNDS, which is the Brazilian Development Bank, and Banco do Brasil, and all of the private financial institutions have done a lot of work this last year in order to make these finance lines more accessible, and they have been um, they have been very, very uh, well succeeded in the sense that BNDS has now increased its funding. He used to have not even 20% of the funding and he increased it to over 50% of the funding because he's going so much quicker in the acceptance process. So um, one might look here and, and not be very excited, but I have to say that I've been looking at this since 2010. And it, it is exciting to see how um, all of the financial institutions have been engaging and working together, both private and public, in order to get um, this to work and to align incentives and, and to take this out into the field. So that's, that's one, of the, one of the points that I wanted to make. However, um, and this is a little bit about what I'm, what I, what I'm telling, there's a, a need for a paradigm shift and a cultural shift for the farmer also to understand all of these new techniques and what can be done and what kind of credit he can access for that for this shift to happen. So it's up also to us from academia and for governments and for financial institutions to engage together in this process to make this, um, to make this move forward. And understanding the huge opportun opportunity there is to implement low carbon agriculture and increase productivity. Um, so that's one point. But before I, I open to comments, I think it's super important to present a study we did last year um, that was commissioned by our finance minister at the time because he wanted to know um, what were the potential benefits for society if all of the ABC goals and all of the NDC goals, at that time it was just an intention, um, if they were all implemented, what would be the benefit for society? What, what are the benefits that low carbon agriculture can bring to society in terms of GDP, in terms of occupation, in terms of tax revenues? We can, we, we can already know that in terms of productivity, it's going to help a lot, but um, what is it in terms of all of our, our, of our economic and social indicators, how will it help? And so when they commissioned the study for us, we decided to do an input-output model, which basically does all of these shows, forecast these productivity shocks in the future, and try and figure out the impact of the economy as a whole. And so basically we did that for all of the goals of the ABC plan and the NDC implementations, and for some of the technologies of the ABC plan, like recovery of rundown pastures. And basically what we found is that it would be actually quite positive if all of this happened. Again, um, beginning with the environmental um, result of that, which is the most uh, important from the standpoint of a sustainability um, studies researcher, what we're saying here is that we will need less land, we will capture carbon, we will increase productivity, and therefore we will be in compliance with our forestry code, we will up and ameliorate our water um, existence, we will help in our ecosystem services, um, we will be in compliance with our international commitments. So from that standpoint, um, we would already have to say that this is positive, even if the cost for the government or for, or for society would be uh, negative. But turns out that when we did ran all of these economic models, the benefits are also quite positive in terms of GDP and occupation and tax revenues. So if we did the productivity shocks for recovery of rundown pastures, there would be an incremental return on GDP apart from the, the incremental um, GDP return in general, but just from this productivity shock of 145 billion highs, 12 billion highs in tax revenues, additional tax revenues, and 9 million extra occupations, um, which again, if you think about the amount of um, occupations that we've lost in these last couple of years, it is quite relevant. So we're having 12 million and 9 million occupations would be quite relevant. Um, we've also done, done these input-output models for integrated systems, and again, we have positive results above 100 billion for GDP return, 
and six million occupations and five billions in tax revenues. Um, of course, these models, they have a lot of limitations. We're not even taking into consideration here the potential um, shock and increase in demand and how Brazil is going to be quite important for food security in the future. We're just saying that if we only did productivity shocks in Brazil, this would already be the positive result until 2030. And so um, clearly when we show this to, to government, it seems um, that we have a lot of win-win situations here. And so it makes sense for us to invest our time, invest our money, invest our capacity building, and invest all of our efforts in low carbon agriculture and low carbon technologies in order to get all of these potential gains in the future. Um, so to finish off my final remarks, um, obviously there are a lot of challenges when you implement innovative public policies when you implement new technologies. Um, our friends here can, can let us know a lot about um, the hardships of implementing new businesses and creating the paradigm shift not only in um, one or two farmers in a niche, but creating scale to it and, and changing the, the way that we are going to do agriculture, not only in the country, but if it be replicated in, in the world. Um, but we have a huge potential for this. It's already happening. Um, we've, we have the benefit of having already a learning curve of more than five crop seasons of understanding and learning what it is that um, we need to do in order to have even bigger production um, productivity shifts and, and shocks. Um, so it is an exciting time. There are many challenges. We've been um, for these years just basically tapping all of the challenges and looking at all of the micro levels on what ways that we can up this process, but I have to say it, it is exciting to see um, the potential that we have and, and some of the challenges that we have already overcome. And I think the best news is, is that we are engaged in not only the agro sector, but specifically, um, I work very, very specifically with the financial sector in Brazil, and they're extremely engaged in trying to make this move forward. And so therefore, um, with that, I think we have the potential to make uh, the best possible application of this public policy and the financial mechanisms that already exist and will come from that. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Um, just important to mention that we will have to monitor these results to make sure that they're going the right way and also um, create and make sure that what, what's not going right, we can make the path correct along the way. It's definitely going to be a hard process, but um, I think we're, we're on the right track. Um, I'm going to stop now so we can comment afterwards. And if you have any questions also very technical on the study, um, I can also send you the links afterwards and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Precise. Very precise. I'm not having any trouble here with time. <laughs> so uh, I would like to pass to start now with the comments. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, three exceptionally uh, prepared, actually, uh, commentators. And uh, the first that I would like to give the floor to is Tiago de Araujo Mendes. He works at the IDB. Inter-American Development Bank, and uh, he's, he's, uh, he's at the Division of Climate Change and Sustainability. And he was, previously, he was at the helm of the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and, Sustain and Sustainability Division in Brazil. Uh, Tiago is also part of a panel of experts of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. He has, uh, he's a certified reviewer of greenhouse gas inventories and is a member of the group of experts on national communication of countries. Uh, so that means that he is the perfect person to talk to some people who do not believe in, in climate change. <laughs> And he's co-chair of the executive committee of the Warsaw International Mechanism on Losses and Damage to Adverse Impact of Climate 
change. Uh, Tiago is, has a PhD in sustainable development, a master in geography, and a bachelor's in international relations. He is a professor at postgraduate diploma in environmental projects management at, 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 in Puki Minas. And so, please, Tiago, uh, you have. Uh, what I would like to do is to give the, the, the commentators two rounds of five minutes before opening to the public, okay? So, please. Thank you very much, uh, Elsir, and I also would like to thank uh, CSIS and also APEX for inviting the Inter-American Development Bank to participate in such amazing panel and also a very exciting topic, which is the Brazilian uh, agribusiness sector model and how is the impact on global development. Uh, my comments, it's, uh, it's very difficult to speak after very brilliant presentations from, from Priscilla and Paula, but my comments will be concentrated in uh, some of the challenges that we have to face on how to maintain the model that is successful so far. And uh, I will speak quickly in two major points. The points also as was indicated by us um, uh, from the perspective of the climate change topic. Basically, the climate change topic has two major uh, perspectives. One is related to the mitigation of the causes, meaning the reduction of greenhouse gases emission, and also the second part, which is the adaptation, or meaning like how we interact with the adverse effects of the climate change. In regards to the first part, uh, as was explained before, Brazil already has a very serious framework to tackle the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Brazil already has a very strong public policy connected with a very interesting uh, uh, credit line that's uh, Plan ABC, as was explained before. However, what I would like to bring in terms of the challenges and why uh, uh, the experience from the Inter-American Development Bank is also associated with dealing with some of these challenges is how we can engage the financial system to actually broke the market failure that we have now, which is to identify the resources of a low carbon agriculture products as an additional revenue to the open market. And why I'm saying that? Because if you, if you uh, take into consideration the explanation of both uh, Priscilla and Paula, it was clear that the basis of the public policy is associated to a fiscal addition towards the creation of a new market uh, to implement low carbon agricultural technologies. Once that we have now a restriction in the fiscal policies in Brazil, then we have a big challenge. How to fund the additional resources that's needed, as it was explained by Paula, at the end of the tipping point of the graph, it shows that there is a variation there because due to the fiscal difficulties, the Brazilian government was not able to keep up the five percent or 5.5 percent of interest rates to the credit lines and had enhanced it by three percent every year. So, so uh, talking uh, from the perspective of United States to say to the agriculture producers here that you're going to have an additional three point percentage in your debt for running your business at the agricultural sector, this will make a major shock. And this is also true in Brazil and elsewhere. So the difficulty that we have to challenge, and, and my comment on regards to this part of, the, of the, the presentation is that, how can we actually engage with the international financial systems to interact and to create like climate bonds or innovative uh, financial products that could substitute the participation of the Brazilian treasury towards the incentives that is needed to implement low carbon agriculture. 
I hope that uh, I was fast enough and also provocative, provocative enough to, to, to our panel members and also to the public. Thank you very much, Elsa. Excellent. Thank you, Thiago. Um, would you like to comment on that? Yeah? yeah? Please. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, you bring up such a good point. <laughs> yes. Um, we've been discussing that a lot, actually, um, this past year, not only in academia, but with the Brazilian Banks Federation. Um, we're in a big project there for, for the last couple of years and, and during this year too, understanding exactly that. We, we need the private financial sector um, to have a bigger participation and not only that, but funding from international financial institutions, international climate funds, um, you name it, we need help. <laughs> um, so one of the things that's happening right now in Febrabo, we're running a lot of studies. One of them, for example, is on the potential financial mechanisms for con conservation finance and restoration finance of forests and where would that money come from? Where is the funding coming from? How can you align the incentives and create potential new mechanisms with new fundings from um, potentially international uh, institutions to make this uh, move. And also not only specific in restoration finance, but uh, in low carbon agriculture, they've been working a lot in trying to um, not only ameliorate the bureaucratic processes to make the, the, the funds flow quicker, but also to create new mechanisms that could get different kinds of funding than not just from the government. So um, the good news is that uh, the discussion is, is very much underway and is happening. Um, the bad news is that we haven't found a solution yet, so it'd be very good um, um, to get some help. Um, all the help is, is, is needed, but it's definitely something that is, is on the table and is being discussed by uh, not only us, but a a everyone um, who is trying to discuss funding in Brazil, what, what are our alternatives? So. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. I would like just to, to add, actually, thank you, Thiago, for all your points, but uh, in, f what I could say for Apex that we have not only the challenge of engaging the financial systems in terms of bringing um, financial help for increasing technology and productivity, but also I think one of the main challenges of Apex in, in, and of the Brazilian government in general in Brazil is to engage the private sector itself to see the value on um, putting efforts in terms of competitiveness and sustainability and uh, and we see a lot of challenges in the subject also and then I I would just my comment will be just to add it's not only the financial system but we have and we see this clearly in Brazil the the challenge of talking with the private sector and engaging and showing the importance of competitiveness we have even a program with FGV uh, to, to try to, to show companies, small and medium companies, because the bigger ones already uh, have more, are more sensible for the subjects, but to show the importance of being more competitive. And this in the agro sector for sure, but in other sectors too, then I think it's a, another challenge that I would add. Uh, I would like now to uh, give the floor to Geraldo Marta. Geraldo is a coordinator of the Brazilian Agriculture Research Corporation, known usually by Embrapa, which is one of the most important institutions in Brazil. And I was commenting on the on the incredible things happening in terms of productivity in agriculture in the last 30 years. Well, Embrapa is behind most of it. So, uh, 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 Geraldo is the coordinator of Embrapa's research program. Here in the US, they have something that they call uh, Embrapa Labex, and they have, uh, they have those labs in some countries, uh, here in the US, in Europe, and in some other places. He's a member of the Commission for Sustainable Agricultural Development of the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, and Food Supply. 
and he was previously a member of the Embrapa Strategy Management Committee from 2013-2015. He was a Deputy Chief of Strategic Studies at Embrapa and uh, General Coordinator of the Strategic Intelligence System of Embrapa from 2012 to 2015. He was a professor of graduate courses in animal science at the University of Brasilia between 2006 and 2012. And he is the leader of uh, the research group in one of the most important Brazilian uh, entities, uh, the, the so-called CNPq, and has been uh, working with Cerrado for a very long time. Geraldo has a degree in agronomy engineering from uh, the University of Sao Paulo, a master and a PhD in agronomy with an area of concentration in animal science and pastures at the University of Sao Paulo, and has a postdoc in economics, nobody's perfect, <laughs> by the University of Brasilia. Please, you know. Thank you very much, Elsher. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Michael, for this kind of invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure to be here. And on behalf of Embrapa, it's a huge opportunity to share with you some of our thoughts, uh, some of our results. I'll, I'll try to be brief, which is very complicated, right, Caruso? Caruso is our agricultural attaché here in the US. Uh, I think one important thing to remember, uh, we already consider some of our achievements here, uh, I mean, in Brazilian agriculture, but it's important to stress how fast this has happened. For you to have an idea, up to late 60s, Brazil received food donations, for example, from USAID. Up to early 80s, Brazil was one of the major food importers in the world, and today we are only second to the US in terms of agricultural exports. So if you consider the whole European Union, we, we, Brazil will be third on ex exports. But if you consider only countries, you have the US, Brazil. So this transition, this transformation was really impressive. It was really fast. It was only the lifespan of one generation. And what was the secret behind that? The secret, it was a long-term commitment on a science-based agriculture. Long-term commitment from the public sector, long-term commitment from the private sector. The public sector provides huge incentives, huge efforts in terms of agricultural research in Brazil. For you to have an idea, back on 1980s, the level of investments in Brazilian agriculture was 1.2% of the agricultural GDP, 1.2%. This is exactly the level of today's investment in R&D in Brazilian economy. So agriculture actually started 25 years ago. And from 1990s up to today, the level of investments in agricultural research in Brazil is about 1.8, 1.9%. So this is one of the secrets behind Brazilian agriculture, the long-term commitment on a science-based agriculture. And unfortunately today, over 90% of those investments are coming from the public sector, and we need to bring more the private sector to engage in this research in Brazil. The opportunities are fantastic. Also, we have the long-term commitment from the private sector in here. Uh, it's very important that we need to be proud of the Brazilian farmers because of them, without them, <laughs> nothing of this would have happened, right? They are the major actors transforming the things, transforming agriculture in Brazil. We are providing new knowledge, new tools, but without the farmers, nothing would have happened. So, we need to understand that the farmers, they did a very fantastic, marvelous job in transforming Brazilian agriculture, and they are still doing today. We are talking about incentives, they are talking about subsidies. I'll give you some numbers. If you consider uh, the OECD numbers for producer support estimate, is an estimate of the money that serves as incentives to farmers worldwide. From 1995 to 2014, the level of incentives in Brazilian agriculture was 1.6%, 1.6% of total uh, farm uh, receipts. 1.6%. Here in the US, it was 
13.5% and in Europe over 20%. So when we are talking about financing, actually uh, Brazilian agriculture is already financing uh, itself, you know, because this is very tough. The farmers, they are pretty exposed to market signals. So as they are exposed to market signals, they are going to adopt technology when they perceive that technology is going to pay because they have no other chance. You see, uh, the perception not necessarily will be true, but if they have a kind of misleading perception, that's it. So one thing that is very important, and we are talking this uh, during the lunch with uh, Paula, we need to run some risk analysis risk premium analysis. We need to understand better uh, what are the perception of uh, the farmers, you know. But this is a very important point to be expressed. And I think my five minutes should also be done, but I, I, I would like to stress a last final point that was not expressed up to now. Actually, perhaps two points. One is regarding the land saving effect. Uh, Priscilla, she has shown that was 150 million. Uh, actually, this is not correct is 608 million when you consider the land saving effects providing by beef productivity gains in Brazil. We run the analysis from 1950 up to 2006, that was our last agricultural census, and when we decompose the factors of production, 79% was explained by productivity gains, and 21% was explained by land area expansion. And this is one of the reasons because 62% of the Brazilian territories is still preserved. I'm not sure if you are aware, but uh, you know, Brazilian territory is a little bit larger than continental US. So when we are talking 62% is still preserved, this is something really huge. And we are not only increasing in terms of land productivity, that is a partial productivity. When we consider the total factor productivity, for the past four decades, Brazil was one of the leading countries pushing you know, the frontiers in terms of total factor productivity. The value was something around 2.3% a year for the past four years. When you consider again to the rest of the Brazilian economy, we are talking about a total factor productivity of 1% per year, perhaps a little bit less. Uh, and the other point, we need to consider that agriculture, especially thinking about the future, will be pretty much dependent, pretty much intensive in terms of knowledge and relationships. So partnerships, not only within the country, but across boundaries will be very important. Uh, to give you another number, today, 68% of Brazilian agricultural product is already dependent on technology. And it's very difficult to, pre to predict what's going to happen in the future. But if today is already 68% depending on technology, in the future, probably it will be more and more intensive on knowledge. So. We need to continue to have these investments, not only on capital, but also on human capital. We need to continue investing on research, development, and this, those partnerships. The final thing now, Elsher, is that we're talking about agriculture, we are talking about food security, and that's it. This is really important. These are the basic, most important brawlers of agriculture. But when we bring to discussion uh, this whole new opportunity about bioeconomy, you know, not only producing, for example, plastic, but producing bioplastic, not only producing chemistry, but green chemistry, we are now transforming the soybean plant, and this soybean plant is producing substances that can treat HIV. We are transforming the cotton plant that can produce substances to treat some forms of cancer. So, these new novel applications, not only to the agricultural sector, to food feed sector, to fiber sector, to energy sector, but also considering the bio industry and the biopharmaceutical is very important. And always going to put new pressures on land, always going to put new pressures on the agricultural sector. And I'm really confident that uh, we are able to keep the pace, you know. We are able to keep the pace and continue this very successful path, recognizing that we still have a lot to do, but we already did a lot. Thank you, well, sir. Thank you, Geraldo. Uh, I'd like to uh, pass to you guys. Any comments? Yeah, after that. So le let's go to Matthews, and then, and then we'll come back to the, to the presenters.
Matthew is the Deputy Director of uh, the Federal Relations in the Environment and Agriculture Department at Bayer. Uh, previously, he had position at Bayer, including Senior Management of Government Relations and, and Deputy Director of Political Affairs. Uh, prior to his work in the private sector, he had a political career spanning almost 10 years, including position as uh, campaign manager, legislative uh, aide, subcommittee, staff director for the House of Representatives in the Committee of Agriculture. And Mr. Perry has earned a, a Bachelor's of Science in Political Science from the University of Cincinnati. Yes, sir. And I know that uh, many of you were looking at your program a little bit confused looking at me. Uh, unfortunately, my colleague uh, Alessandra, who is the head of uh, uh, stakeholder affairs and uh, stewardship in, in Brazil, uh, had some travel complications, so you get the uh, the, the B squad here. Uh, <laughs> my apologies if I'm not as interesting as her, but I'll try to do my best and, uh, and relay some comments that she had prepared for me. Uh, first of all, thank you to CSIS and to Apex. Uh, really appreciate the time that we have here uh, to, to insert the, uh, the company uh, perspective in the growth of Brazil and the agribusiness sector. Um, uh, so thank you again for having me. So who is, uh, who is Bayer? I think we all know who Bayer is, one of the uh, uh, global leaders in life sciences with a focus on uh, human, plant, and animal health. Uh, we are one of the leading crop protection chemistry companies as well as uh, seeds and traits uh, along a, a whole variety of crops including uh, uh, cotton, canola, a lot of other products there including vegetable seeds. Um, we also do have a, a fairly strong uh, principled um, stance in having sustainable farming practices as one of our uh, benchmarks and how we uh, think about bringing products to market in the different uh, markets that we're serving. Um, focusing a little bit more on, the, on the, the topic at hand, growing market and consumer demands regarding uh, safe and high quality food that's produced in a sustainable uh, way is an increasing challenge for, for farmers throughout the entire uh, uh, globe. Um, if you cannot prove your, your compliance to these, uh, these standards of sustainability, uh, international standards, uh, it's going to be hard to be competitive in international markets and it can oftentimes decrease your ability to be profitable. Uh, so for Bayer and, uh, and other companies to help growers reach these uh, social and environmental standards, uh, Bayer has developed what's called the Valori Certification uh, Program. I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that word correctly. I don't speak uh, Portuguese. So again, more apologies. <laughs> Um, uh, so Bayer set up the certification program, the scheme, and uh, it's, it's for various crops within Latin America, and growers need uh, help and sometimes support during the process uh, of implementing uh, these certification programs. So Bayer set up Valore, which uh, seeks to make Brazilian producers fit for international markets. Uh, the program is contributing towards the uh, 2030 UN goal of ensuring sustainable food production systems and implementing resilient uh, agricultural practices uh, that increase increase productivity and, product, uh, and production. Uh, this program was developed in Brazil in around 2009 with a focus on helping these, these growers reach these so social and environmental uh, certification standards, and it's based on a stepwise approach. Uh, we have bronze, silver, and gold levels, and they contain the principle of continuous improvement. Besides people from Bayer, it involves external partners in the field such as consultants, environmental experts, third-party auditors, uh, experts like Embrapa and other organizations who give training, uh, conduct gap analysis and audits. These pro uh, protocols and requirements are crop specific and uh, enable a sustainable agriculture production in accordance with uh, international market requirements and uh, to, to essentially achieve consumer demands globally. The program is aligned with the main global global certification standard, such as Global GAP, uh, which is already recognized as uh, equivalent of RTRs and other certification regimes. Um, perhaps in the second round, I can give you a, a, a focus, which is specific um, case study, which is on sugarcane, but we also have this uh, program available for fruits and vegetables, soybeans, uh, coffee, corn, um, and essentially the, the entire uh, thinking behind this is to add value along the entire food chain. So I guess with that, I will stop and uh, thank, thank you again for including us in the uh, discussion today. 
Thank you very much, Matthew. And uh, now I'd like to turn over to our presenters. Well, I think I have uh, two comments. First, on um, on Geraldo from Imbrapa. Thank you for correcting the number. Actually, as it's a, a lot <laughs> comparison with 150, it's a great correction. And uh, <laughs> I will never discuss with Imbrapa in terms of those numbers. And um, and what I I, I like to, to point out is that um, and it, it joins a little all the the speeches that we have made here and the presence of buyer is also. Uh, what we wanted, the message that we, we wanted to pass also is that the agriculture, uh, the agribusiness in Brazil is a huge area of, that it's open for investment. And and, the, and that answers a little the question of Tiago, that we are thinking also in the how to engage the financial system. But what Brazils want now, and I, I can speak for the private sector, surely, but also for the government and discussions that we are hearing more and more is that we want to engage also the international private sector to be able to come to Brazil to understand better uh, how our agribusiness work and to, to expand the level of partnership that we are uh, dealing in this business. And I think uh, it, it it's just a way, I'm not discussing actually any, any point, but it's, it's a way of summing up all the, the presentations here and, and, and all the discourse on Embrapa and uh, the, the openness of, of Brazil and also in, in, in investments, is, it's quite important and to exchange the experiences we have in this field to other partners and, and to probably also big American companies such as Bayer. I think it's Paula will. Yeah, actually, I, I couldn't agree more looking for me on, on the academic perspective. Um, the more that we study and look at the potential, and uh, not only study and look at the potential, look at the challenges and how to get through these challenges, but also be able to share this with other areas of the world, um, learn from each other, um, not only our experiences, but also get what's working from other countries and, and, and share, I think, the better, the better we, are, we are off. So um, in terms of what Geraldo said, I, I, I second that, and I think that we should do more analysis on risk premiums and understand the farmer's perception. We've been, we've started doing that and going a little bit more to the field, and BRAPA is always on the field, and so we're trying to partner more and more um, to go into the field and get these case studies and get these perceptions and then bring them to the private sector and then bring them to the private financial institutions who are so far away from the day-to-day -day of the field um, that they don't know the reality on a on day-to-day on a -day basis. And uh, the opposite too, like bring the perception back. So, um, but of course, the more we do that, the more we'll be able to speed up this process that has already gone even faster, but knowledge and um, sharing of this knowledge is going to be everything. Um, and just to finish on human capital, I mean, that's, we work with a lot of human capital, um, speaking on the academic side and R&D, and I think it's crucial. Um, the numbers on, on, on R&D, they're, they're growing and they have to grow a lot more and even more and so and also on human capital um, for sure and so I second that and I am super open um, what, whatever we can do in terms of more research and more dissemination and more discussion I think it's going to be beneficial for everyone. Yeah. Thank you Paula. Uh, do you have any additional comments before I open to the floor? Actually, I, I, I'd like to, to make a comment. Uh, when we are talking about farmers being so exposed to, to markets, one thing that is uh, really strategic to consider is that they are promptly respond to relative prices and market imperfections will change these perfections, uh, these perceptions. So, in the case of Brazilian agriculture, uh, especially for the poor farmer, uh, generally the small farmer, uh, this guy is not able, say, to, to buy larger amounts of fertilizers or other modern inputs. So generally, uh, the per cost, uh, the unit, uh, the cost per unit, it will be higher. And generally, imagine this guy is working with livestock. He's not going to sell trucks and trucks of cattle. He's going to sell one, two animals. 
So probably the price he's going to receive, it will be lower. So he probably will lose on both ends, on buying you know, more expensive inputs and receiving a little bit less uh, for the product uh, he or she is selling. So we are also running some analysis to understand a little bit better what would be the impact of, you know, if not correcting, at least attenuating those marketing perfections, and it's huge. And we, when we are considering financing, when we are considering policies, it's very important to keep in mind this because this, those marketing perfections, they will change the universe of technologies that are going to be available to farmers. And sometimes they are not going to adopt the technology, not because they do not want, but simply because on their perceptions, uh, they can't adopt. So I, I think it's important to, to bring to the discussion this. Uh, we need to manage also how we can alleviate those market imperfections as well. Thank you. Any comments? Okay, I'd like to open to the floor. If you could please identify yourself before asking the question. Uh, yes, hi, my name is Russ Webster. I work for CNFA, Cultivating New Frontiers in Agriculture. Um, first of all, thanks for a really great presentation and lots of really useful information. And of course, congratulations to all of you for being involved in such a success story. I had a question that um, has to do with the dissemination of technologies and the dissemination of practices to producers. Um, if you look at the Brazil case over the last couple of decades, I'm just wondering if there were some particularly innovative approaches that uh, either, either the, uh, the government used for extension services or were there innovative approaches in the use of any digital uh, sharing of information? But if you look at the uh, dissemination of these new practices for producers, what do you think was really the driving force behind that? And is there something that we can all learn from that in Brazil? Thank you. Sure. Um, I think for a company like Bayer, um, we look at Brazil as an incredibly attractive market for us to bring our products to market, both in, in seeds and uh, in crop protection chemistry and, and biologics. And when it comes to innovative uh, ways to bring that to the to the growers. I, I kind of want to, um, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd share this this case study that I mentioned earlier that uh, that Alessandro wanted to, to talk about, which is uh, Huayra Mills, which is a Brazilian sugar cane producer. And we, we came together to, to do this project back in around 2013. And uh, they're a fairly large farm. And I had, I think it's uh, about 53 hectares. Um, and the, the feature of this particular solution was the fact that it, it brought in a lot of training programs for employees. And I think we partnered with, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong the, with the, the correct uh, uh, terminology, but with Embrapa and uh, local research institutions. But we, we had a series of um, uh, training sessions with regard to safe tractor and equipment processes, linking that with digital agriculture, uh, application technology and safety training for crop protection products. Uh, first aid, hygiene, um, and then also with international audit uh, preparation. So what it kind of focused on was within, uh, you know, Brazilian sugar cane, one of the primary pests that you can watch out for is, uh, is the, um, uh, the, the root leaf hopper, which can, you know, affect uh, productivity in sugar cane by about 60% when it's present and it's, uh, it's um, coming out pretty strongly. Uh, Bayer has a product that can uh, treat for that if you use it in rotation with an IPM approach. It's called a Cubrix or Curbix. Uh, and it's an insecticide. And when we partnered with them to essentially launch this product, we had a foundational infrastructure to bring the product to market. When we partnered with our research institutions and the local um, experts there, uh, and apparently this this program was so successful that in the last uh, I think three months, uh, Bloomberg TV uh, did a a great series and did a video on this. Uh, this project in, in Brazil, showing how uh, industry, um, uh, government, and uh, private sector all kind of work together to bring this technology platform to growers, and it's been incredibly uh, successful there. Perhaps just complementing, uh, totally agree, but when we go up to the 90s, uh, when the guy tried to get the rural credit, 
it was a sort of mandatory also to have extension service. So this was a way to translate uh, knowledge, to translate new technologies into the farmer. Actually then the extension service had some serious problem in the 90s. And from 90s up to today, uh, private firms, they are getting more and more engaged with farmers. And here comes the part, this digital transformation agriculture is everywhere. Here in the US, in Brazil, you go to Europe, so it's everywhere. So uh, from Embrapa's side, we are trying to develop new apps, new platforms that can be assessed uh, to farmers. And uh, perhaps another thing that is important to mention is that when you go to the southern part of Brazil, where generally we have smaller uh, farms, uh, they are more reliant, they are more dependent on official rural credit. But when you go to the center west, uh, their sources of financing is pretty much different. Generally, we say there is one third rule. One third comes from farmers' pocket, one third comes from these big companies, big ag, ag companies such as Cargill, Monsanto, whatever, and one third possibly comes from rural credit. So, uh, by borrowing the money is an efficient way also to advise new methods, new technology, so uh, they complement itself. I mean, uh, private uh, consultants plus uh, some extension services coming from the state. But generally to medium and larger farms, they are pretty much reliant today from these private companies. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. Uh, one very interesting approach that we are piloting with um, the Ministry of Agriculture, especially on regards on how to enhance the uptake of the low carbon agricultural technologies is a results-based financing scheme. Uh, how does it actually work? This, this uh, project is actually financed by DEFRA, the Department of Food, uh, Rural Affairs and Environment from uh, the Government of uh, United Kingdom. They had actually provided um, um, 40 million dollars of grants to incentivize small and medium producers to uptake the low carbon agriculture credit lines. Um, how we have uh, managed to implement this uh, this project uh, and this approach with uh, with uh, the Minister of Agriculture, basically we are using the resources uh, in a manner that the biggest partner is actually uh, the producer. So instead of actually using the typical uh, um, environmental services payment, where you cover 100% of the investment based on the subsidies that you receive as a cash transfer, uh, we are using, uh, in combination with Banco do Brasil, uh, public calls for proposals. Then the project actually covers between 6% and 30% of the overall investment. This generates an additional uh, opportunity, not only for Banco do Brasil, but also to other uh, financial agents in the market, to provide credit in a lower uh, risk to the, to the producers. Normally, small and medium producers, as was explained by Geraldo, they have some difficulties to find the credits, especially uh, on the correct uh, conditions that they need. So um, sometimes they have to actually put from their own pocket rather than actually going for, for, for a credit line. So what we had implemented, instead of actually having one single public institution to do um, the, the technical assistance, as was explained to him, like during the 90s, we have a fragmentation of the public system of the, of the technical assistance. We had created by the public calls a competition between private sector and public sector technical assistance to provide the, the, the needed assistance to, to the Brazilian producers. Just to, to, to have like a very uh, interesting figure on regards to the technical assistance in Brazil. On average, one technical assistant uh, from a public agency has to cover between 120 and 150 producers a year. So this shows clearly 
that the capacity to really provide technical assistance it's very much reduced because the size of the, the public uh, policy do not reach enough resources to, to, to fulfill the demand from the producers. What we had then implemented is these networks of, right now we have 220 institutions distributed um, uh, and from all kinds of institutions from a, a large national institution such as NR, the National Services for, for Agricultural System, but also very small um, um, uh, technical assistant private companies that could participate in a more broader way on the results-based system. Um, if you need uh, additional information, this project is actually implemented by the bank uh, by the Inter-American Development Bank, which is a kind of unique. Normally, we don't execute projects, but this was actually a request from the Minister of Agriculture, especially to give uh, the ministry um, some inputs on regards or what actually is needed to change the behavior. And we don't know, we, we, we already had partner with Embrapa for this project. They are, they are uh, doing the baseline and also the impact evaluation into it. We don't know yet what is exactly the, 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 the answer for it. Uh, Embrapa told us that they will provide us with the results by, by 2018, but certainly is not only credit, and certainly is not only uh, the capacity building of the technicians. There is something between also in terms of information to the producers, as Geraldo indicated, like the perception of risk of the producers is also a very important part of the component. But we believe that some parts of the producers, if you do not provide them with cash transfers, they do not change the technology. They will remain continually doing the same thing because even you cannot convince them if you don't give them the correct conditions to say, well, I will risk my traditional way of producing and uh, I want some guarantees that if something goes wrong, I will have the revenues necessary. So we are piloting. Again, this is not for 100% of the producers, but uh, the tips that we have, it's probably around those four inputs that, that we have, credit, capacity building, the technicians, and potentially ways on how to enhance the credit associated with cash transfers and subsidies and financial, financial incentives for, for the change. 30 seconds, perhaps I should have said this in the beginning, but Embrapa is the research arm of the Brazilian Ministry of Agriculture. So many times people say, uh, is Embrapa doing extension service? No. Our mission is to do research. Our uh, sister agents here in the U.S., it will be the USDA Agricultural Research Service. So uh, our main mission is to do research, not extension service. Um, just a quick comment. It's actually really good to, um, to hear this because one of the, one of the big challenges we We've been working a lot and discussing with a lot of the financial institutions in this case um, is exactly how, well, A, to get the, um, the representative from the financial institution who is on ground um, to understand what low carbon agriculture is and how he should sell it. So there has to be incentives on that side too for the financial institution. Um, but also, um, there is on the producer side, there is a lot of um, work, uh, how, do, how do you say it in Brazil, like face to face and trust and, and getting understanding what the, the technology is and what your money is going to and what are the potential results. And so, um, one of the things that, that we talked a lot about needed to be worked, um, and Banco do Brasil is great because they have such a capillarity and such strong presence in all of Brazil, um, is exactly that, is how, how do you get the information through in a trustworthy, credible way that the producer, not the big ones obviously, but the small producer will understand the benefits and, and will actually buy into um, getting credit and, and, and trying to make this investment. Um, but then also there needs the risk perception. And one of the things is that a, a lot of the producers 
um, either don't understand or don't believe that, that that's going to happen. And then on the side of the financial institution, they really don't know how to explain it. And so there are too little technical assistance to help. Um, and so we have a, a, an impasse there. And so um, a lot has been been going in terms of research to try and help these links. And I'm really glad to hear that that there's a pilot program. I hope I hope that we can hear a little bit more about it once it's set and done, um, because that's one of the major points to get the, the links fixed. Yeah. Okay. Hello, my name is James Powers from the Center for Water Security, and I wanted to ask uh, about a different aspect of sustainable agriculture in Brazil. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund has found that more than half of fertilizer that's applied to crops in the U.S. turns into runoff into local source water, goes into the groundwater, evaporates, becomes air pollution. I wonder if you, any of you can speak to successes or progress with regard to um, optimization of fertilizer in Brazil. Um, any, any efforts that are kind of ongoing there on the, either the practices or the technology side? Thank you. Perhaps I can start. Yes. Uh, of course, there are cases that uh, there are not the best practices apply it, but uh, in general terms, I would say that we're improving a lot. When you consider, for example, sustainable agriculture, I think the first point is to consider that we have a multiple dimension of sustainability, okay? So we have the environmental side, but we also have the technical side and the socioeconomic side. So, But when we go to fertilizers, uh, if you consider the Corn Belt region here in the U.S., if you apply no fertilizer, probably you're going to harvest a kind of five tons of corn per hectare, okay? If you do the same, the Cejada, I mean, if you do not apply any fertilizer, you're not going to harvest more than 700, 800 kilograms of gram per hectare. So with that, because of the tropical soils, pretty weather soils, you can say that uh, tropical soils, they are a kind of you know, hunger for fertilizer. So uh, I would say that the fertilizers, they are not going to load as fast as, for example, in Argentina or here in the US. So of course, uh, you do have chances uh, to have uh, runoffs, uh, loss of nutrients by erosion. Of course, this always happens. Uh, I mean, the chance of happening uh, is always there, but it will not perhaps be that severe. And also, the level of fertilizers, uh, they are pretty much different. For example, because of the tropical nature of, because of the nature of tropical soils, we demand a lot, for example, phosphorus as well. And phosphorus is not that mobile in the soil as nitrogen, for example. And if you want more data, for example, uh, when you apply nitrogen fertilizers, uh, you can have some serious leaching problems. But again, uh, when you go to tropical soils, of course they vary, but we generally have very deep soils. So uh, we're talking soils that they can easily reach a kind of two meters, two and a half meters. So the potential to, to lose nitrogen by leaching, uh, you know, considering that you have roots that even if you go beneath the, the root zone, you still have roots that are able to, to capture those nutrient leaching in the soil profile. So again, uh, you have the opportunity to, to have a kind of uh, good fertilizer nutrient use efficiency in those soils. But again, you need to follow the recommendations because especially when the relative prices between uh, the fertilizer and, and, and the grain, they are very favorable to applying fertilizers, might be this drive to apply more than needed in order to eventually make a little bit more profit. But if the guys follow the recommendations, they probably will be doing okay. Oh, uh, perhaps just adding the same point, uh, there was a discussion uh, last week saying that Brazil was the second in the world in terms of pesticides. Well, <laughs> two things are important. One thing is that we have a huge agriculture, a big agriculture. And when you go to the intensity, uh, I mean, uh, kilograms of ingredients per hectare, we are using very low levels still. So again, uh, absolute is important, but taking into account 
what would be the amount of in active ingredients per hectare is also very important. Otherwise, you're not going to do the job the chemicals are intended to do, right? Unfortunately, Geraldo took uh, my talking point that I had been ah, sitting here sorry. thinking of. Uh, <laughs> but, but I think he brought up a, a good point that as a technology provider, we would uh, always um, lean on it, is basically looking at um, when we take an active ingredient, we don't sell fertilizers, but we sell crop protection chemistries and biologics. Uh, we, we make sure to partner with our, uh, our soil agronomists, our agronomists there, our, our researchers, to find out what the, the proper recommendations are for spray rates. Um, um, whatever that could be to make sure that there is no uh, unnecessary spraying and, and that kind of fits into Bayer's uh, sustainable farming practices mantra which is essentially making sure that we take the, the amount of care needed um, to make sure that the environment is, is well taken care of. I mean, uh, in the U.S., in, in Brazil, uh, farmers are the best stewards of their own land, and they, and they do their best to, to get the, the most production out of it by doing uh, uh, the best for it to make the, the soil as healthy as possible. And perhaps uh, we still have time. Uh, Elsher mentioned in the beginning, and Paula as well mentioned about those integrated crop livestock in Brazil. This is amazing, and for example, a few years ago, we were having those discussions with some fellows from Africa, and they said, what is different from the systems we are adopting here in Africa? The difference is that we are considering a high, highly intensive crop production and highly intensive uh, pasture, pastoral livestock production. So here's the thing. We, depending on the spot in Brazil, we can produce 365 days a year without irrigation. So, for example, we can have a short cycle of soybean. Uh, they harvest the soybean and a kind of immediately uh, after, we're talking about five, 10 minutes after, there is a, a machine already planting the corn with the brachiata pasture. Then the guy harvests the corn and the brachiata pasture is already established. Depending on the relative prices, that brachiata will be a fantastic soil cover for the next crop, no-till planting, I mean or depending on the relative prices, the farmer can use that brachiata pasture already established to fat cattle. So this is an opportunity. But then we go to fertilizers use efficiency. We had a very old experiment at Embrapa. It started in 1974 or five, and it lasted 25, 26 years. It's amazing. We measure at that time what would be the impact on phosphorus apparent recovery. And here's the thing, when we had only a kind of corn soybean rotation, the apparent phosphorus recovery was 44% of the phosphorus applied. Very good, considering that when we are, we are at Agronomy University, they said that we are going to recover only 20%. So over the long term, it was more than 20%, it was 44%. But the fantastic things happen when we introduced the brachiata pasture in the system because brachiata was able to acquire phosphorus that soybean and corn weren't able to do. So actually, the phosphorus apparent recovery jumped from 44 to 85% after 25 years or so. So when we are talking about nutrient use efficiency, those systems, they can provide a completely new dynamic into the systems, in part because they are increasing soil organic matter, and soil organic matter is almost <laughs> a very, very important thing in tropical soils because of the catchment exchange capacity, oxidis, uh, iron oxides, and this kind of sort of things. Hello, my name is Luis Caruso. I'm the agricultural attaché here in, in the United States, Brazilian agricultural attaché. Congratulations for, for all the presentations. They're great, and it's not a question, it's a remark. <clears throat> I would like, um, the other day our Minister of Agriculture passed by DC and we were in several different forums and uh, uh, some really important point that he was telling is that uh, I believe Priscilla told something about um, we're having Brazil has a 6.9 share of the, the, the all um, the, the agricultural world market and we have the, the Brazil has a plan 
we all need to have in mind the importance of the agricultural sector for the Brazilian economy. And like in, 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 especially in situations like nowadays where Brazil is passing through some economical problems, we have to get back to, to, to the game. And uh, in these cases, the importance of agricultural sector is even more emphasized for, for the country. And we are going, um, we have a, a projection in the, agro, in the Ministry of Agriculture for us to reach 10% of this world market. But to reach 10% of that, um, with this big jump that we need to do from 6.9 to 10%, we're going to do that with all this um, environmental responsibility. We're going to do that with um, zero deforestation. We're going through all these issues that for, from, for that is important, is a, a discussion nowadays for the world, not for Brazil. All the world is discussing this position of being um, protecting the environment. The agricultural sector and all the world, everyone says the same thing. But the fact, as Geraldo said, as uh, I don't remember who said, is that Brazilian agriculture We've been, um, we've been the, the Brazilian producers, which is, as you said, Geraldo, probably our, our may, main asset is the producer. We have, we have land, we have water, we have everything. But if it wasn't for our producers, we wouldn't be where we, where we are. And the producers, they are paying the price. They are pay, paying the price nowadays. They have, as you said, we have like 60, what, 62%, yeah, of the, the 62% of our area of the country is preserved. A big part of that is preserved by the producers, by the producers in those, those um, in, inside their farms, in the, what's the name of that? I always forget in English. The legal, the legal reserve areas, as we all saw, in some places in the country, they are 20%, they are 35%, they are 80%. It's, it's really fast. It's interesting. Our minister said the other day um, for us to, for the ones who, who don't understand, can't view that. It's basically like when you have a, if you're the owner of a hotel and then your hotel has 100 rooms and you have to take care of the 100 rooms, you have to maintain the 100 rooms, you have to clean the 100 rooms, but you can only sell to the public 20 rooms. You can only sell to the public 35%. You can rent to the public 35 rooms or 80 rooms, depending on, on where you are in the country. So it's important that when we look, we see that in the rest of the world, the rest of the world needs to, needs to see what the agricultural sector is doing in Brazil. And we are not asking for the, the, other, the rest of the world to support us, to pay for our producers to do that. But we're asking, and we understand that it's more than correct that the Brazilian products, as you said, Gerardo, we, uh, it's important. Many producers, they respond. The best response is to prices, market prices. We are being totally open to markets, so we need to receive market prices. It's important that an agriculture that does that does, has all this responsibility that we have at least the same access as other countries to our products. That's the, the, the minimum I understand which it should be given to the Brazilian agriculture. Thanks. Thank you. Any final questions? So I think we are uh, close then. And if you allowed me, I would like to uh, thank the panel. I think it was, uh, it was really excellent. Really, excellent. of course, all the moderators say the same thing for the panels, but in this specific case, it's totally true. In in the sense that we we had uh, a discussion that was forward-looking, we had uh, relevant information, as our colleague said, that uh, we we had a lot of information, new information coming uh, to be known. We had a rigorous discussion. And uh, so that's the kind of thing that the Brazil initiative wants to continue to do. I think uh, we will be um, 
promoting similar events next year. So um, we'll be talking about uh, many of the aspects that have been raised here, including the what Geraldo mentioned about bio uh, uh, economy, about the experience of partnerships that uh, we had not only within Brazil but with countries like the U.S., like the European countries, and so on and so forth. That combination of public and private partnerships also is something that uh, we should uh, reflect on. And uh, so I think we'll have a lot, of, uh, a lot of things to bring to the table next year. Agriculture is going to be a very strong pillar of the Brazil initiative here at the CSIS, and uh, I'm counting on you to keep uh, coming. All the material, all the presentations that we had today will be, uh, will be uploaded uh, on the CSIS uh, site, so you have it. And the PowerPoints will be uploaded also, and we'll make sure that you have the means to contact the presenters if you need to do so. So the idea is to open a discussion, to bring information, bring a reflection, and to help you to understand better Brazil and the Brazilian agriculture. Thank you very much. Have a good night.